Good, good evening. Miraculous, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, lords, ladies and gentlemen, sorry. Um, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. My name is John Krebs, and I'm the chairman of the visitors of the Natural History Museum and standing here in that capacity. In case you hadn't noticed, it's a birthday today. Um, not just Abraham Lincoln, but also Charles Darwin. And this event this evening is part of the worldwide celebration of Charles Darwin's birthday. And it's a joint event organized by uh, the uh, Natural History Museum, the Institute of Biology, together with the Bodleian Library and Oxford Philomusica. And my job is simply to introduce um, the chairman of the conversation, uh, but also to um, thank um, Raymond Dweck, who's helped to make all this happen, and Amy Sewell from the Development Office, who has also played a key role. Um, and I just want to make a few housekeeping announcements before I hand over to uh, the conversation. Um, sorry about this, but I have to go through it. Number one, if you hear the fire alarm, I hope you don't, a continuous alarm, the instructions say, leave the building quickly and calmly through the nearest available escape route. There are two staircases from the gallery on the north and south ends. Have you got your compass with you? Uh, do not stop to pick up your personal belongings. Report to the fire assembly point in the front lawn in front of the building and do not re-enter until authorized to do so. So that's fire. The next thing is mobile phones. If this was the cinema, I'd suddenly have that background noise of phones ringing, but I can't do that, so please do switch off your mobile phones now. And the final point to say, we've got cameras, but please, no photographs during the conversation. The conversation is being filmed and will be available on the university website. Uh, as well as a podcast on the Guardian podcast website. Um, so those are my um, introductory housekeeping remarks, and I now it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Jeremy Paxman, who is going to uh, moderate the conversation. Uh, Jeremy, it says that I'm supposed to introduce you, but you need no introduction, and so I simply hand over to you to uh, introduce the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I wouldn't worry too much about the health and safety announcements. The chances of a fire two days running in the same place are extremely remote. <laughs> um, now, uh, when I was uh, invited by John to come along this evening, uh, I was under the impression we were recreating the Huxley-Wilberforce debate of 1860, uh, which although it seems in history to have had such a profound effect, very few people were able to provide any kind of accurate record of at the time or indeed 30 years afterwards. Uh, you'll recall that in that debate, um, Soapy Sam Wilberforce, not played by the bishop on my left, uh, asked Huxley whether he was descended from an ape on his grandfather's side or his mother's side, and Huxley is supposed to have replied, although I don't think with any evidence he'd rather be descended from an ape than a bishop. <laughs> and, but actually claimed to be able to remember only afterwards that he'd said he would rather be descended from an ape than to use his talents to obscure an obvious truth. I was rather alarmed uh, and therefore accused of being a typical um, trivial media type to discover that both Richards have uh, agreed that they're going to have a civilized conversation <laughs> between them this evening, which will include no such invective. I therefore rather rely upon you to in inject uh, as much controversy as you like. And I was rather struck with the remark that Huxley made, because he was actually rather reluctant to appear the first time uh, he was invited. He felt that a general audience in which sentiment would unduly interfere with intellect was not the public before such which such a discussion should take place. 
Now, this will, of course, not apply in your cases, and you're free to ask any questions you like, uh, preferably as difficult or indeed as rude or repeated as you wish, um, of either of our protagonists. Uh, but as you've come to this friendly stitch-up between you, uh, <laughs> who, who have you decided will go first? We, we haven't talked about we it. We haven't talked about it. <laughs> I, well, uh, I don't think so to stand up in a court of law, you know. Um, right, well, I think you could start then, Richard. Winston Churchill said... History will be kind to me. I intend to write it. <laughs> and I think something of that went on it, on this occasion because the, the main account that we have of this seems to have come from Huxley. And uh, he, of course, gave a good account. Um, other people felt that Hooker was actually the one, you know, Sir Joseph Hooker was actually the one who trounced uh, Bishop Wilberforce. Bishop Wilberforce himself was of a different opinion, as we saw uh, in the um, Divinity School just now, looking at the manuscripts that were kindly laid out for us. Um, he wrote a letter to somebody saying that he just got back from having a discussion with Professor Huxley, and he said, I feel that I beat him thoroughly. Uh, so we have at least three completely uh, separate conflicting accounts of this debate. I have to confess that I have always regarded this debate between Huxley and Wilberforce as a bit of a bore. Uh, I'm more interested in the issues than in winning debating points. And so I'm looking forward to uh, getting on to that with, with uh, Richard later. Yes. Well, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to get on to any issue you want, Richard, but I think it is important to put the historical record straight as you have begun to do. The great myth of religion opposed to science originated 40 years later in a story in the Gentleman's Magazine. It's a wonderful story. Nobody could resist it then and nobody can resist it now. The truth is very different. The so-called big encounter was not a big encounter. It was a side meeting. Uh, neither Wilberforce nor Huxley were billed as the main speakers wasn't advertised in advance, they were just called on uh, to, to, to speak. Um, and you, as you rightly say, uh, Joe, the, the, the main uh, intellectual force for Darwin at the time was actually Joseph Hucker, uh, Hooker. Sorry. But um, a very brief word about Wilberforce himself. He was no slouch, he'd got first in maths, he had a very keen interest in natural science. He was vice president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. He'd written a 39-page detailed review of the origin of species in the Quarterly Review, uh, which uh, Darwin said was uncommonly clever uh, and had picked up all the weak points uh, in his argument. So he was no slouch. And of course, what we have to remember, this is very important, most of the best known scientists at the time opposed Darwin. So in Wilberforce, in opposing uh, Darwin, was really standing uh, on the side of what you might call the conventional science of the time. Now, I think most objective observers of this occasion did think that Wilberforce had, had lost it, not on the grounds of science, but uh, the fact that actually he came across rather badly and he wasn't very popular with Oxford Dons. Um, and it was, I think it was Huxley's son who said uh, that actually it was a kind of failure of manners uh, that, he, that he had lost it. As for um, Huxley, um, sorry, as for, as for Wilberforce's review of the origin and also indeed perhaps his performance at, at this discussion, it's widely believed that it was written by Richard Owen. Um, and that's where, when you say he was no slouch, um, Richard Owen was no, was no slouch. No. And um, we don't know, I think, how much of Wilberforce's review was written by Owen. Did he believe in the creation myth? Uh, what, Wil Wilberforce? Yes. Um, yes, I think, uh, I think he did, as, of course, did the majority of scientists at the time. They, they thought uh, that all species uh, were created, as it were, ready-made. Mm. Um, that was the... Uh, prevailing view at the time. Do of you course, believe it? No, I don't. No. Why not? Um, simply because uh, all of all that evolutionary biologists, biologists have shown us, 
uh, about the whole process of, of evolution, 